You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com All right, friends, welcome to the broadcast. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan, where it is already the 1st of August, 2012, here at 11 a.m. But for most of you back in North America, it must be the 31st of July. So once again, thank you for tuning in for tonight's edition of the broadcast. And tonight we're going to be turning our attention to one of the most important uh, geopolitical events that is taking place in the world right now, and that is leading us uh, towards what looks more and more like an international situation that could lead to the major conflict of the 21st century. And we're talking about the battle for Syria that is happening even as we speak, with things only intensifying by the day. And for those of you who haven't been keeping track lately, the latest is about Aleppo. And uh, there's a lot of news coverage about this uh, battle that's taking place right now, including the Los Angeles Times, flight from Aleppo, Syria, bodies, shelling, and chaos, and many other such stories talking about the fighting that is raging in that country right now. So it is my honor to have on the line tonight someone who has been a guest on CorbettReport.com, but it's her first time appearing on Corbett Report Radio. I'm talking about Syrian Girl, a Syrian uh, national who is uh, currently not based in Syria, but who is is commentating about Syria, and uh, it's a great to have her on the line to go through all of this. So, Syrian girl, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, as I say, this is your first time on the radio broadcast, so it might be the first time some people are encountering you. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about who you are and the types of commentary that you're doing on the Syrian situation? Um, I'm a, a Syrian by blood. I'm, I'm, I'm an expat. But I have gone back to Syria numerous times, and I two years ago I was living in Syria for a few months, and uh, I've been involved in politics for uh, close to a decade, um, just not in a public sense. And I have a YouTube blog; it's uh, Syrian Girl Partisan. I have a Twitter, which is Partisan Girl, and a Facebook, which is Partisan Girl as well. I have, don't have a website, I'm afraid, but I'm working on it. Well, I'll look forward to that when you get it, and and please let me know, and I'll pass it along to the listeners. But certainly you have been doing a lot of commentary on Syria, and uh, you've been on a number of different alternative media broadcasts talking about the situation there. Uh, We only have a minute or two before the break, but broadly speaking, how how have you found uh, people being receptive to this information or not receptive to this information in the alternative media world? I think in the alternative media world, people have been uh, very receptive to the information, because... um, because my voice isn't really controlled by any side, there's some logic behind it, there's um, truth behind it, and especially the reason people are turning to the alternative media is because they are thirsty for truth, which they haven't been getting from the controlled mainstream media. Unfortunately not, and I think that's reflected everywhere in the coverage, and uh, one doesn't have to read very far into any of the stories that are uh, taking place right now in Syria to, to find that, and especially now with uh, this, this battle for Aleppo that's been being hyped uh, quite a bit in the mainstream media for the last several days without any kind of context about Aleppo and the type of city it is and the type of people who live there or why this is suddenly the, the focal point, despite having been a government stronghold as called by the, the that same mainstream media for a long time, suddenly it's the flashpoint for all of this rebel activity. So clearly some big things are taking place there right now, and as I say, it's only continuing to come to a head. But as I say, we are coming up against our first break, so let's take a short breather. If anyone out there would like to get in on the conversation tonight and talk a little bit about what's happening in Syria, ask your questions of Syrian Girl, you can get in at 1-800-313-9443. That's 1-800-313-9443. Or you can tweet your questions to me at Corbett Report, and I'll do my best to get to them on air. So let's take a short break, and we'll be right back with more after this. All right, friends, welcome back to the broadcast. Once again, you're tuned into Corbett Report Radio here on Republic Broadcasting, and I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Tonight we're talking to Syrian Girl, who is available at YouTube.com slash Partisan Girl Syria. Did I get that right? 
Syrian girl yes, partisan. Yes, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I always get that confused. And twitter.com uh, slash partisan girl. Uh, once again, the links will be in the show notes for today's episode at corporatereport.com slash radio so that you can go there if you haven't checked out her work before. But uh, let's let's get straight off the, the top here, straight into the latest developments and what's happening right now. Obviously, the battle in Aleppo taking um, front and center stage in terms of the coverage right now about what's going on in Syria. What can you tell us as a little background about Aleppo and uh, where it's where it really stands in all of this uh, fighting? Well, Aleppo is the most heavily populated city in Syria, even though it's not the capital. Um, it's also a very, very old city, and it's got you know, um, all of the religions and sects are living together. So you have uh, Christians, Alawites, and Sunnis, uh, and, um, you know, millions of people. And from the beginning, it was, as you said, uh, one of the most anti-conspiracy, um, anti-insurgency cities, and it had the biggest rallies that were against the insurgency. So uh, they the insurgents have already failed in their offensive against uh, Damascus. And now they're trying to make Aleppo their kind of Benghazi, um, uh, how do you say, as it, as it was in Libya, like a stronghold. Um, what can I tell you? They're coming in from outside Aleppo. Uh, some of them have had uh, cells within the city where they um, rent houses or they kick people out of their house and they occupy the apartments and they use that as a base of operations. But for the most part, um, they're coming in uh, to the rural areas around Aleppo and that's where most of the skirmishes are happening. Right, because if you're reading the, the mainstream coverage of this, it would seem as if this was the, 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 the heart of the rebel uprising or something, and it's some sort of spontaneous thing. But uh, again, if you read into the, the history of this, even the way it was being covered in these same publications several months ago, they were saying this is, this is where the government supporters are to, the large, to a large extent. So, so you can confirm that basically this is people from outside of Aleppo who are basically trying to infiltrate the city in order to uh, swing it around towards the, the rebellion. That is absolutely, absolutely the truth. Um, you could easily tell that because the battle has been moving. You know, it, it's not uh, been uh, the insurgents. You can track their movements, and they have been moving to where the battle is. And right now, uh, where the battle is is Aleppo, so they've been uh, flooding into there. And it's not just from all around Syria; it's also from all around the Middle East. Uh, even CNN recently reported that more Libyans are being sent in to Syria and if you watch uh, Syria Tube you can see that a lot of the insurgents have uh, the Libyan camels that uh, were left over uh, when the Americans gave them the desert fatigues so um, that's what that's what Aleppo is facing, it's facing an attack by foreigners, it's not facing a grassroots uprising as they're trying to portray Exactly. So that's interesting because if they can frame it as if this was something that was happening within the city spontaneously, then any violence that happens there must be the result of a government crackdown. Whereas in reality, it's the exact opposite. The violence that's happening there is because the rebels are trying to infiltrate and to start violence in the city. That's exactly it. And I think it's to try to uh, grab on to the idea that uh, Syria is spiraling down and... Um, the government is, is, is just about to fall, and even now the major cities are being attacked. But the fact is, I think that uh, even though for the, for the, in a the few weeks we might see a lot of losses for the government side, at the end of it, they're going to fail just as they did in Damascus, just as they did in Homs. And uh, it's, it's premature, but it's, it's coming to head, and I don't know what strategy uh, the NATO powers are going to employ as they get more and more desperate as it becomes more obvious that uh, their insurgency is failing. Well, what, what's at stake in, in terms of Aleppo itself? Obviously, if the, the most populous city in Syria were to fall to the insurgency, that would be a, a huge swing in terms of the momentum. But, uh, but it, what, what would be the next part of that strategy? I, I know you just said what, what could be the strategy. I don't know either. But, but where do you think this, this might be heading? I... Honestly, I haven't uh, 
thought about it because I don't think that there's any chance that Aleppo is going to fall. I think that's very, very unlikely. Um, if it does, then that would be a terrible, terrible defeat uh, for Syria. That would be that would really be uh, maybe the turning point. Uh, it's it's very unlikely though, um, because it's the most populous city and it kind of uh, demoralizes everybody if if that were to happen. But I don't I don't believe it will. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, what might happen, though, if the insurgency gets defeated, uh, I think that uh, they ha are planning, the native powers are planning some kind of false flag involving chemical weapons. And a lot of blogs have been uh, talking about this. And in fact, a lot of the insurgents inside Aleppo are wearing gas masks. So that's the um, sense that we're getting, especially since uh, Israel has been talking more and more about uh, serious chemical weapons being... Uh, uh, taken over by terrorists and we have to secure serious chemical weapons and uh, the foreign minister McDesey had to come out and say uh, if we had chemical weapons because the Syrian government neither confirms or denies their existence but if we had then they would be secured and we would never use them against our population. The idea is uh, to, to create uh, such a situation where uh, serious chemical weapons have to be like taken away from them by the UN or uh, you know uh, so the same kind of thing that they did in Iraq with the WMDs. You're exactly right. I've seen that that meme, that idea coming up in the news recently, and uh, we've even seen reports from the Atlantic that uh, that Russia behind the scenes, certain unnamed anonymous officials have concerned that confirmed that Russia had to talk Assad out of using the chemical weapons on the protesters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's definitely something they're they're pumping and trying to hype up quite a bit. And uh, it does uh, have so many shades of, of what happened in Libya as well. Of course, right after the, uh, or during the time of destabilization of, of the Gaddafi regime, they were suddenly, uh, all of a sudden, they were concerned about the, uh, the, the chemical, biological weapons that he had. So it shows the, the same pattern happening again and again. But uh, what about the, the sense of the Syrian people? I mean, obviously, these weapons, to the extent that they exist, have existed for a long time, and uh, Assad has never used them against his own people so far. So what is the, the sense on the ground of people? Are, are, is there any genuine fear that this would ever be deployed against the, the no. Syrians? No, there isn't. It's totally ludicrous to even suggest it. Uh, those weapons are, if, you know, if are only to be used if in the case of foreign attacks, you know, the rumors are that they exist, of course, but I'm, I'm certain that uh, nobody in Syria is concerned that the government would use chemical weapons against the Syrian population. There's no gain to be made there. It's totally, uh, it's going to kill everybody across the board. It's going to alienate everybody against the government. It's a totally lose-lose situation. I mean, it would not benefit them at all to use it. And they're there only as a deterrent uh, for foreign attack, basically. That's well, well, that's the thing that strikes me. It's so cartoonish to think that even if Assad was as evil as he is being portrayed and as hell-bent on killing people, uh, clearly there's no strategic benefit at all to using these weapons against your own population. So I don't understand how people can be expected to believe that. But we have a caller on the line, so let's go to your calls. Once again, anyone else who wants to get in on the conversation, 1-800-313-9443. The phone lines are wide open. But let's go to Mike in Maryland. Mike, thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call, and thank you, uh, Mr. Corbett, and your brave guests there for attempting to get at the truth about what's happening in Syria and the Middle East in general. Now, if, uh, if I may make a comment or two and then ask a question, and um, it, it's just what's happening in Syria is just so textbook 1984. It's so Orwellian, because first, al-Qaeda was their enemy, so we had to go into Afghanistan, then Al Qaeda is our is our ally in um, uh, uh, which we used in, in Libya, and now they're our so-called ally uh, against Syria. And, and it's like Webster Tarpley says, uh, we're using the Al Qaeda and the other mercenaries as a kind of a, a foreign legion 
to attack countries that, for whatever reason, um, stand in the way of the Western imperialist and neo colonialist. And I would like to ask uh, your guest, and maybe you as well, James, if I may use your first name, um, what is the end game here with, with all these wars from Iraq, Afghanistan to, uh, to uh, and, and the toppling of, of governments in Egypt and, and Libya and Syria? What, what is the end game here that the West has in mind? What's, what's their ultimate goal strategy? It can't be something as simple and ephemeral as, as oil and simple economics. In my mind, there has to be some, some, some grander strategy, some bigger uh, game at play here. I, I wonder if, if either one of you could comment on what you think the, the, the really the end game is, like Alex Jones would say. Yeah, well, the absolutely. End game I, think is here. I think you're right. It does have to go beyond simply the oil politics uh, idea that has been propounded in, in previous conflicts like this. Uh, I, I think there is a much bigger agenda at play in the region generally and bigger geopolitical game at stakes. But uh, we're coming up against another break. So once again, we'll have to take a few m- moments uh, breather. Uh, Mike, if you want to stay on the line, that's fine. If you want to take the, the answer off air, that's fine. Anyone else who wants to get in, 1-800-313-9443. And we'll be back to answer that question about the bigger endgame in Syria right after these messages. You know it's time to get the facts straight. Lots of crucials, Freemasons. You know that people... All right, friends, welcome back to the broadcast. You are tuned into Corbett Report Radio, and we are talking to Syrian Girl tonight about the situation in Syria. And we have Mike from Maryland on the line who's asking about the end game in Syria and whether this goes beyond simply oil geopolitics and what the the real end game is as of, of course I don't think Syria will be the end of the line when it comes to this type of foreign interventionism in the region but let's get uh, Syrian girl let's get your take on that what do you think is the end game and where where is this heading well uh, first of all I just wanted to briefly um, comment on uh, the first thing that you said about uh, Al Qaeda Mike uh, that it's straight out of the books of 1984, George Orwell. My friend today is my enemy tomorrow and vice versa. In fact, uh, you said that Al-Qaeda was their enemy in Afghanistan. Before that, Al-Qaeda was their, en- their friend in Afghanistan. And they, they are the ones that uh, created that organization. They are the ones that are maintaining its existence. So I just wanted to say that briefly. Um, as for Syria, you know, there's, n- there's not just one reason, there's so many reasons. If you look at Syria on a map, it's in a very strate- strategic spot. Uh, it's kind of uh, n- in the center of the world, we like to say, because it's uh, got all of the continents around it, the European continent, Asia, Africa. And also it's uh, got access to the five seas, the Mediterranean, the Caspian Sea, uh, it's close to the Suez Canal. So. If you control this area of the world, you know you have a lot of sway as to what's happening, trade, etc. It's, it's the if you control this area, you control the world. Um, so that's of course one part of it. Uh, so in controlling this area, you can uh, get a oil pipeline flowing. Yes, we can mention the oil, the oil. Not so much taking the oil, but controlling the oil flow is more important than the oil oil itself. Um, and in this way, you can also uh, push away rival economies uh, such as Russia and China that have their own um, uh, outline for how they would like to, to progress their economies. Um, and of course, if we were talking about uh, things that are more um, not in line with countries getting their, their benefit, if we go to ideology, well, the Zionist ideology is uh, very, with Israel in the region, they have their own designs about how they want to see the Middle East turn out, and they still hold on to the idea that they want uh, the Nile to the Euphrates. So uh, in taking uh, Syria, they take down the, one of their s- strong enemies that's always been a roadblock for them, and uh, get, get their ideology rolling to, to get this Nile to the Euphrates, Israel. Quite right. And of course, absolutely, that plays into the the larger strategic game that they're playing with Iran as well, obviously. Um, Yes, all good points, and I concur with them. Uh, Mike, did that answer your question? Well, yes. Well, I I concur with with their um, 
you know, uh, her assessment of the, of the regional geopolitical and economic aspects. But I, I think there's something even bigger than that planned here, because I think the same tyranny that's, that's being perpetuated by our government will eventually be turned on the American people. I think foreign assets will be bought here. The same thing will happen. Uh, the United States will eventually be turned into a giant Iraq. But uh, for me, first, I think the, the, the over, overarching plan is a one-world satanic government, a one-world go- currency, a one-world religion. And these uh, Arab, uh, these these recalcitrant Arab countries must be bought to heel because they aren't under control of the European Central Bankers, and that's one of the major things that they use to control populations and governments. And uh, that's why we are in Africa now, and that's why ultimately, you know, China was made into a, a pseudo-fascist capitalist state that's controlled by the Western. Uh, Industrialists and bankers. So, so for me, it's ultimately a one-world government under the heel of a, a very evil entity. I, I can't dispute that. I think when we look at the larger, larger picture, it's definitely about that, uh, and it's certainly trying to destroy any significant opposition to that. And it's interesting how the axis of evil lines up with people who don't have European-controlled central banks in their, you know, dictating their economies. But Syrian go- girl, your take on that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I'm thankful that you made the comment. Uh, Syria especially doesn't have a central bank, and uh, for... Uh, uh, Sorry, you're breaking up a little kind. bit there. Can you can you restart that sentence? Uh, yes, Syria is definitely not under the control of the central bank and hasn't been uh, for decades, and I think that uh, that's one of the reasons it's being attacked. It's not under the fold of the New World Order. So I, I totally agree. I, there's another theory that's going around, uh, especially in, in the one world religion sense. Uh, you can notice that all of the secular governments are being attacked in the Middle East. You had Iraq, Libya, and now the last one that's left, Syria, is being attacked. So uh, they, they want to Islamatize the Middle East for whatever reason. And one of the theories is that they were heading for some kind of inter-religious war uh, where, um, you know, all of the Middle East is both under one side. And, uh, maybe the, the end game of this is the, the end of the religions, the, the prime religions. This is all just es- esoteric theory, but... Um, but I think it does it does line up, and we do see the way that Islamic extremism is being really directly promoted and helped and funded with Western support. And one has to wonder why that would take place, except to further the conflict and to, to make it exacerbate what's going on. So uh, lots to talk about there, Mike. Thank you so much for your call and your comments and questions. And anyone else, 1-800-313-9443. The phone lines are wide open. But let's take another short break, and we'll be back with a nice long 18-minute segment with Syrian Girl right after these messages. All right, friends, welcome back. Welcome back once again to the program you are listening to. Corbett Report Radio here on the Republic Broadcasting Network, and tonight we're talking to Syrian Girl. For those of you who haven't checked out her commentary, she has a YouTube blog at Syrian Girl Partisan, which I suggest you do check out because she has a lot of uh, very important information on what's happening in Syria, obviously, and how this plays into the larger agenda, which we started to touch on there before the break. But let's let's talk about that in some more degree of detail because, unfortunately, like uh, like myself and many other. Westerners, uh, we don't have a great handle on the the regional sectarian politics and the the, the the various sects that are at play. For example, in Syria, so let's start talking about the uh, the Shia Sunni split and and uh, how the Christians and the Alawites and all of that play into this and what kind of mixture we really have in terms of uh, what's happening in Syria. Uh, sure thing. Um, first, I'd like to talk about uh, you know when Islam began, it was one sect. Uh, so then it's split up into two, Shia and Sunni sect, based on what happened after the Prophet, prophet died. And the Prophet Muhammad was uh, the, the prophet, uh, the last prophet we call him. Before that, you know, you had Abraham, Jesus, etc. Uh, so it's an Abrahamic religion. But uh, after he died, there's some contention on who was going to uh, lead the Muslims after that. And some people said it should have been 
uh, Ali, the um, adopted son of the Prophet Muhammad, and then other people said, no, it should be should have been the Khalifa. So those that followed the Khalifa were the uh, Sunnis, and those that uh, followed Ali were the Shia. And since that time, there was some bloodshed in when the the power struggle happened, and that bloodshed has been continuing on uh, from there. So. Between the religions, there's only some very minor differences. For example, when they break their fast, when they start Ramadan, uh, when how, exactly how they pray. To someone from the outside, especially me who wasn't really brought up uh, under a specific sect. I mean, if you look at my background, I'm from Damascus, so uh, it's a Sunni background. But especially Damascusian people, they don't uh, really think so uh, strongly uh, about sects. To me, uh, the, the whole uh, conflict is, is it's a little bit ridiculous and it's quite frustrating to see uh, so much uh, bad blood between people who are so similar. But I think that outside forces exploit it. And especially I think that a lot of the world religions are being hijacked by the world powers. And it, it's been the case for, uh, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Judaism was, I think, under Zionism, you know, brought under the fold. And with Islam, they're trying to do that now with this Wahhabism, and otherwise known as Salafi sect. And it's extremely, uh, how do you say, they literal in its interpretations, not of just the Quran, because uh, in Islam there's two books. You have the Quran and the Hadith. The Quran is the spoken word, it's the word of God, and the Hadith is sort of like, hearsay, what people said the Prophet said, and it's often contradictory. And these Wahhabis, they take the, the worst interpretations of these hadiths and they make them fact, and on top of that, they add their own religious rulings. So they're seen as a fringe group, but they're really taking power, and actually the, um, Al-Qaeda follows this version of Islam. So when it comes to inside Syria, we don't really have Wahhabism. That's more something you see in Saudi Arabia. Um, but what we do have is uh, sh Shias, Sufis. Uh, Shias only to a very small degree. Um, most, for the most part, it's Sunnis, uh, Christians, and Alawites. And Alawites are um, a version of, uh, you could say they're related to Shias, and they're not quite uh, the same as Shias, but they're related to that. So uh, I think in the CIA World Factbook, and I'm not sure if it's accurate, they say that it's 12% Alawite, 12% Christian, and 70-something uh, percent Sunni. So um, I'm not exactly certain if, if that's accurate, but um, following that, you know, uh, Syria, though, has a very secular society. We've had uh, all these religions living together peacefully for a long time. So in any sect, you'll find people are like, strongly holding on to the secular idea. We don't, don't really want a um, merging or a marriage between religion and state. It's, it doesn't belong in Syria. It's not for us. So uh, I think that's, that's uh, the uniting force for Syria right now. Um, well, and that, I think, is something that underlies a lot of what's going on here and that the, uh, the, the Western media likes to try to cover up is that the ra obvious ramifications of uh, the, the insurgency that's happening right now coming to power would be a type of cleansing or, or retaliation that, that might uh, take place. And even BBC is now admitting that uh, with a story that just came out, Syrian Christians fear future as violence worsens. Obviously, there will be that type of reprisal that uh, the long repressed Sunni majority would uh, likely meet out if they came to power and I think that must be something that we should at least be considering in all of these uh, the, the political games that are taking place there right now. I think it's already happening in part uh, especially in Homs there was you know RT came out with a report that the churches were ransacked and uh, it, it was uh, first of all reported by Prison Planet I think um, and you know th there's been so many refugees being created uh, or Christian refugees, they're kind of being uh, expelled from the country uh, due to fear and, uh, and ostracization. So uh, it's, it's already uh, happening. Um, it's, it's also in part, you know, it, it's across the region as well. It's not just 
inside Syria. There's, uh, the fact that the Syrian government is allied with Iran is a point of contention for a lot of uh, people, especially in ru rural areas. And in the rural areas, you have people who are uh, not as highly educated, unfortunately. And, you know, they are poverty-stricken, so they have more of a reason to be angry, I suppose. And uh, they, if you feed them, you know, that they, these are apostates and they, they are against uh, God, etc., they, they, will, that, they will follow it. So, unfortunately, these people are being used as puppets, they're being used as, sh as sheep to the slaughter for the, the bigger powers, the uh, Israel, you know, they're basically fighting Israel and US NATO war for them and of course, you know, if we look at the bigger picture as well, the, the, the fighting the war for the, the new world order and the world powers. Well, that's right. Well, let, let's bring in some of that bigger picture because a lot of the way that this operates is that uh, that narratives are formed about the, the what the situation is on the ground in Syria, and that is used to play on public's perceptions of how this is going to play out. So I'd like to draw listeners' attention to an interesting report that just came across the newswire on publicintelligence.net, which is an interesting website if people haven't checked it out. They have a lot of leaked documents and open source information on a number of things from government sources. And here they have Open Source Center Master Narratives Country Report on Syria. So this uh, says, quote, Understanding master narratives can be the difference between analytic anticipation and unwanted surprise, as well as the difference between communication success and messaging gaffes. Master narratives are the historically grounded stories that reflect a community's identity and experiences or explain its hopes, aspirations, and concerns, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on from there. You can actually download and read the report itself, but it's basically talking about what they want you to believe are the master narratives driving the, uh, the events on the ground in Syria. And they start talking about the various, basically, conspiracy theories, theories that those strange Syrian people have about what's happening. So, uh, Syrian girl, I know you haven't had a, a chance to read through the whole report yet, but you have uh, at least skimmed over this a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about what the U.S. government is trying to say about what uh, the Syrian people are thinking. I think that they got our number, to be, to be honest. They, they were quite accurate. Um, yes, one of the things they said was that Syrians are very, uh, across the board, all over Syria, it's accepted that there's a conspiracy against Syria, that there, we're all conspiracy theorists. And yes, that, from my experience, that's absolutely true. Uh, but just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to kill you. So the fact is that there is a conspiracy against Syria. We are aware of it, and um, we we know who our enemies are. We know that the U.S. and Israel, uh, the imperialists, don't have our best agenda at heart. So um, I think in this uh, paper they they talk about the ideas that Syrians have in their mind, the fact that they are being uh, attacked by uh, Zionist ideology and by uh, the Zionist puppets in the Arab world, and that there's a conspiracy inside Syria uh, made up of traitors who would sell our country, um, and that you know Syria should be united. And we we do draw uh, our pride and history from the fact that we are the we were the one of the cradles of civilization. So uh, in that sense, you know that's that's quite accurate. Um, the other things that they talked about in the report was the different sects and how they feel about the government. And I think the whole point of the report is to basically get inside the Syrian mindset and try to destroy the country from the inside. Uh, that, that was really the purpose, that's the feeling I got from the report. It's like a step-by-step -step how to manipulate Syrian mentality into destroying itself. Well, that's interesting because that seems to me to indicate that there's two levels of, of the propaganda and one is for the public mass consumption where they dumb everything down to a ridiculous level and tell you that Aleppo is some sort of battle for freedom by the uh, the, the inhabitants and all of that kind of stuff. But on the uh, other side, they have these internal reports that they issue from their own you know government agencies, which are actually accurate and are real portrayals of, of the what's happening on the ground and the way people are thinking, precisely because they want this type of real intel and information that they can use to turn against the, the population. I think the most interesting thing as well is that they acknowledged that there's sectarianism uh, against Alawites and Christians 
in uh, the ideas of rural Sunni, Sunni people, um, it's it's in there that there's this uh, you know Alawites are apostates and uh, infidels, and they want to exploit that. I mean, it's in the document that they were trying to exploit the sectarianism. So it's it's amazing that they just admit it, but of course it's not going to make mainstream media news. No, it isn't. Well, let, let's turn to another interesting aspect of this, because uh, we tend to talk about Western media and Western um, propagandists and Western uh, political uh, I I power players, I guess, uh, of all being of the same stripe. But I think one of the interesting things about this is that there has very much been two different competing factions when it comes to Syria and whether or not there needs to be military intervention or simply arming of the rebels or that type of debate that's happening. And uh, some of the people who are involved in this include the very aptly named Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is a professor of politics at Princeton and uh, part of the Princeton Woodrow Wilson School of public and international affairs and she's been one of the biggest cheerleaders for the idea of intervention and arming the rebels and all of that and uh, i understand she has a brand new op-ed out in the financial times but it's not available online unless you want to pay for that and i don't want to pay the financial times anything to feed me their propaganda so i don't know what she said but it's probably along the lines of an op-ed that she wrote back in june in the washington post it went under the headline, Syrian intervention is justifiable and just. And she's arguing in this against Henry Kissinger, who himself was warning about the dangers of intervention in Syria. And she's arguing that basically, oh, it can be a good thing as long as we have a nicely defined UN Security Council mandate. And, uh, oh yes, Libya was just about getting Gaddafi. It wasn't really about helping the people, but that's only because we didn't have the clearly defined mandate. So uh, some very interesting propaganda and dancing around the issues going on in plain sight there, but it seems at least to indicate there are at least a couple of different camps when it comes to this, how to handle this Syrian situation. So how, what do you make of this split in the political caste uh, between the people who want outright intervention and those who want more subtle types of intervention? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure who Anne-Marie Slaughter is. I haven't come across her work before, but uh, as for the split, uh, between people who want outright intervention, I think uh, it's just naivety really on, on their part. If I think both sides want outright intervention, both sides would love to be occupying Syria or attacking Syria militarily, no matter the cost, uh, just because it, it, it's more, the gain is more power, but they cannot, they can't, that's, that's the uh, real thing here. They, the question is ridiculous in, in the first place because first of all Syria's air defense is too strong for a no-fly zone. The only no-fly zone that is already being imposed in Syria is the one that Syria is imposing on everybody else. So that's out. So if you're going to go into Syria you're going to go in without air defense. And I don't, I've never seen a single time where the US has been prepared to, to send its troops in without air superiority. So, some kind of military intervention would only happen, uh, you know, under the table in a very dirty manner where they send mercenaries in and uh, special forces. And already, they're, basically, they are sending mercenaries because Qatar is paying salary to these foreign fighters to go fight in Syria. And Western mercenaries has been reported to be inside Syria as well. So. That's the, the only way they can wage the war, is the way that they're waging it now. They're doing everything they can already against Syria, and if they could do more, they would. So people like Anne-Marie Slaughter, who are really gung-ho about it, um, I think they, you know, the whole purpose of, of, of their voice is to try to give hope to the insurgents on the ground that, you know, big, tough, U.S. bully is going to come in and, and, and save them when that's not going to happen. They're the sacrifice, you know. Nobody's going to help them. That's, that's the truth of it. And, um, yes, that's, it, it's all part of uh, keeping the momentum flowing and, and getting people to beat the drums of war. I think that's the only logical explanation I could make for comments as illogical as that. I think you're right. I mean, it has to be an argument over strategy rather than an argument about the fundamental premise that Syria needs to be 
needs to be intervened in some manner. So I think you're right. It's just a question of, oh, well, we might we might not be able to commit the type of intervention that we want, so let's do it more subtly. And uh, unfortunately, that's that's the way it's playing out. Although, interestingly, the, uh, the Kissinger op-ed that she cites in this uh, Washington Post op-ed was arguing that uh, we shouldn't go into Syria because of it would imperil the foundation of world order. So, uh, so some interesting rhetoric that goes on about this, but I think you're right. It's not really questioning the fundamental premise. Well, uh, absolutely, there's so, so much to talk about, but again, we are coming up against another break, so we will take our final break, and we'll be back to wrap things up with Syrian Girl. And there's just time to get a squeeze in one call if anyone out there would like to get in, 1-800-313-9443, or tweet a question at Corbett Report. But until uh, then, let's just uh, hang on. Just sit right there. We'll be back in a few minutes after these messages. No matter how hard you try, you can't stop us now. All right, welcome back to the program, friends. Here we are in the final few minutes of Corporate Report Radio for this Tuesday night edition of the broadcast. So once again, thank you all to, for tuning in. And tonight we've been talking to Syrian Girl about uh, what's happening in Syria right now, which is unfortunately still on the knife edge of tension. And there is so much happening there. And I really hope people have their eye on what's happening there. Even during this uh, summertime for people in the Northern Hemisphere, it is still uh, a very important situation and one that's unfortunate folding very rapidly so i i just hope people are staying up to date with what's happening there and uh, we have one more call around the line so let's go to the final call carol in idaho thanks for joining us tonight hi james thank you uh, your guest is certainly uh impressive um it's good to hear her uh, i just wanted to um uh, ask you probably both are aware of albert pike the father of freemasonry who wrote morals and dogma way back i guess about mid 19th century, early to mid-19th century, right? And in that book, we have to realize that it's no accident that we, the evil Western powers, are now socking every single Arabic um, nation over there um, because uh, Albert Pike said he predicted all three world wars. He said exactly what the, um, what the uh, cause of World War I would be, what would cause World War II, and now we're building up to World War III. And in World War III, he said we are going to manipulate things such that Christianity will be pitted against Islam. And, of course, the, in my view, it's the evil um, Zionists that are fomenting that. Thanks to the American dollar and the British dollar, I mean, it is the most shameful, heartbreaking thing. So That's right, Robert, and for people out there who don't know about that, I believe that comes from a letter that he, he wrote uh, uh, back in the late 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe that's even in the British Museum, so if people who are interested can find out more about that and how the uh, world was going to be manipulated into this position and what would be the solution offered at the end, but of course the, the mystery religion that's, uh, that's behind it and the, the free Masonic idea that Pike was promoting. So I, a very interesting piece of the puzzle. Um, absolutely. Do you have a question or a comment? That, that was my comment. Okay. I just wanted yeah. to point you to that, that that was predicted 100 years before even the First World War. Absolutely. So. Some pretty um, incredible stuff. And uh, again, rega- regardless of the, the, where that came from or, or whether that was uh, you know, engineered that way or not, it's certainly the place that we are in. And I think there is some, something to that agenda. All right, Serene Girl, any final thoughts on, on that part of the agenda, the put it, pitting of Christianity against Islam and how this is uh, the clash of civilizations that people like Samuel Huntington and others have been writing about for decades as well? I think you'd be surprised, but in Syria... Uh, the, f- the power of the Freemasons is kind of common knowledge and it's featured on our state media a lot. Uh, you know, we know that they are kind of allied with also the, our Zionist enemies that we're facing. So um, I think it would, it's kind of blind not to notice these uh, uh, secret societies that have existed for several hundred years who have, you know, gained power through some pyramid scheme uh, for this time. And it's, uh, it's maybe a wild conspiracy to some, but I, I do feel that what's happening now is definitely engineered for a while. 
Well, it's uh, not a wild conspiracy if it's true, and uh, the Syrian people are not conspiracy theorists if the conspiracy against them is true, so absolutely. Well, uh, Syrian Girl, we always appreciate your thoughts and insights on what's going on there in Syria, and uh, once again, I hope people are paying attention to this, so I will direct them once again to your YouTube and Twitter and your Facebook, and we'll put that in the show notes for tonight's episode, so I hope you're working on that website, because I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And on that note, we will leave things there for tonight. Uh, Once again, I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and I'm looking forward to talking to you all again tomorrow night. So until then, thank you for listening and take care.